It's quite important for me to always underline that the work is done in collaboration with these talented people. We co-produced a new type of experience called atmospheric memory. About half of my practice is objects for museums or collectors or foundations. And the other half is more temporary, sonne lumière, you know, experiences that are ephemeral. And this particular project brings both together. The subject is a book written by Charles Babbage called The Ninth Bridgewater Treaties. Babbage was the inventor of the first mechanical calculator, which we see here, the difference engine, and also the first conception of a programmable computer, the analytical engine, which we see here, which was famously programmed by Ada Lovelace as the very first software. Now, in 1837, Charles Babbage wrote that as we speak, we create turbulence coming out of our mouth and in the air. And he wondered if we had a computer that was so sophisticated that we could calculate the movements of all of the particles of air coming out of our mouth, we could actually rewind those movements and recreate the voices from the past. So to Charles Babbage, the atmosphere was a vast library that contained all the words that had ever been spoken in the past. The project is how can we make a big exhibition that makes this tangible, that allows us to eavesdrop or make tangible the atmosphere and not take it for granted that everything is being recorded. So we do things like we have a laser tomograph that measures the voice of someone as they speak, and then it creates these density slices, we put them together into a 3D model, and we create the world's first 3D printed speech bubble. Atmosphonia is 3000 loudspeakers, each of which has a different sound channel being played back. We have, for example, 200 sounds of insects, different insect species, 300 birds. We have the sounds of waves and wind, but also metronomes and bombs and children. And the idea is that you walk into this 37 meter long corridor and you hear this cacophony. But it's very weird because even the person that's sitting one meter away from you is hearing a completely different sound. So these points of light that you see there are at each a loudspeaker and whenever it's lit, you're actually hearing back that sound. We call this speaker as pixel. Can we create an image, a sound image, out of the cacophony of 3,000 sounds, almost as if we could eavesdrop into this turbulent chaos that the atmosphere that Charles Babbage imagined was? The chamber is a massive bespoke projection area, exhibition area, that is constantly changing. So several different pieces coexist in this massive projections. So, for example, we have this, which is a text stream. It's the collected works of Babbage and Ada Lovelace presented as some kind of cloud-like constellation that forms their writing. A lot of different pieces that have to do with turbulence and water. And some of the pieces uh, that are memorable is, for example, this one is called Cloud Display. And it's an artwork which makes uh, your voice into cold water vapor clouds. Nation. And then the fountain just... Ego. We'll use voice recognition to transcribe whatever you say onto and then generate this text um, almost again as a way to, to try and make tangible um, addictions. Nobody tells you what to say or not to say. We presented this first in 2019, so it was the height of Brexit. So a lot of people would write, fuck Brexit, uh, also fuck Trump. That was fine. That's uh, what uh, display should allow you to do. And then gradually, the project becomes a bit of a dystopia. And it asks the following question. Do we want to live in a society where everything is recorded? where nothing is ever erased, never forgotten. The project starts becoming a massive scanning device where the atmosphere is not neutral, where everything is being recorded. And one of the ways that we do that is with this project that we did with Krzysztof Odyszko, the Polish artist, who basically was telling me that in communist Poland, there were rules, for example, against the assembly of more than three people in public space. And there were very clear definitions of how far away you could be to somebody else before your relationship was deemed illegal or suspicious. So this project actually has 12 cameras tracking everybody in the room and then trying to reconnect them and archive who that were they close to, whether that 
relationship was suspicious. At the very end of the show, everybody who's been looking at the works, the works have been looking back and it records them and it runs a really particularly egregious algorithm called a Tisney that compares them for facial features, for gender, age, race, and then places them into this massive tableau. So everybody kind of sees themselves at the end of atmospheric memory. You realize that what is the memory of the atmosphere is an important question to ask in a digital domain as well. At the very end of the production, the texts come back and they move very, very slowly. And gradually cloud display becomes like a waterfall and it starts invading all of the space where people are occupying in the, in the projection chamber, creating this kind of hybrid between a work that is Instagrammable, but it also has a certain degree of critical perspective, a poetic perspective. Basically the question, and especially after COVID, this is more important than ever, how do we not take for granted the commons, specifically the atmosphere? At a time when the atmosphere is trying to kill us, say through the virus of COVID or say through 418 parts per million of carbon dioxide, which is what we're breathing that no human in the past history has ever had to breathe so much carbon dioxide. How can we make this immersive environments, not into some kind of retreat or bubble where you can kind of forget about the problems that we have, but to reintroduce the problems in a way that I best describe as, as, as what the Zapatista slogan of the 90s was, which is that we're not asking people to dream, we're asking them to wake up. You use the term tangible, but of course it's all intangible. It's conceptually tangible. You're bringing these ideas down to a level or up to a level. You're right. It's not so much tangible. Sometimes it's more about illustrating, right? Like how do you illustrate? What would it sound like if you could eavesdrop into all of these different turbulence and eddies of voices from the past. At the end of the performance, what happens is everything that people have said onto the different microphones gets recorded and played back. So their voices get played back and there's a certain kind of Lynchian sort of doubling up of you hearing yourself from the past playing back, which is effective at sending this message about the atmosphere that we live in now is what Babbage wanted. And the question is, do we want that? So at the end of the day, do you erase? We are always kind of having like an archive of who was there, but new recordings erase the oldest ones. And we think of that as the kind of memento mori. You know, it's like you are in the artwork at that time, but eventually you will disappear from the artwork. And so, yeah, on the subject of capturing and keeping information, we don't do that, but we do recycle it constantly. These works are in public and they really need the viewer. They're not complete until the viewer appears, right? We're right on the boundary between the seduction of participation, where you want people to, to receive a large number of people who will Instagram themselves and so on and create this kind of interest that it's also economically viable to have this kind of work. But at the same time, try to pervert our objectives when we're doing this kind of immersive work. For me, if you think about Van Gogh's, immersive Van Gogh's, which are sprouting out everybody like they were fungi all over the world, right? Why is it that people go and pay 30 bucks to go see what they all have already seen over and over again? Well, it has to do with scale. It has to do with immersion. It has to do with creating an opportunity for people to talk to each other. But how can we take those gargantuan presentation mediums that, that are becoming more and more widespread to create something that's a little bit more critical, more poetic, or more historically cited? These are the questions that we're trying to really look, look out for. Why should we always have these artworks be this pleasant armchairs where we just kind of go and photograph ourselves and our family? Is there a way to have both and, and the answer, I don't know. That, I mean, that's up to the critics to determine. But can we bring in a, a larger uh, group of people, a crowd, and at the same time deliver something that has a bit of a contribution to, you know, the critical issues that, of our time? I imagine you don't call yourself a media artist. No, I do. I do. I call myself a, but I don't call myself as a new media artist because okay. I think anybody who studies enough art history knows that what we're doing is not new. These are progressions or variations on traditions of experimentation that go back hundreds of years. I should mention the show actually has on view at the same time as all of these different artworks about the environment 
on view are original 19th century objects. Like I actually bought a first edition of the Ninth British Water Treaties, which is on view. We have like a 19th century Phantasmagoria slide. We have uh, the, and one of the very first telegraph keys because that was very important in the establishment of environmental science. Because when we first opened the project, we did it at the Science Museum in Manchester and the Science Museum in Manchester owns uh, one of the parts of the analytical engine uh, by Charles Babbage. So we actually had the analytical engine on view as part of the show. So as it tours, we try to bring aspects of this kind of culture of science into the project to give validation or at least attention or a relationship to the past. Because I feel as an artist, whatever we can do to be connected to those questions and those kind of research lines makes the work better than to pretend that we are original and new, which is super boring and dumb and corporate. What do you really mean when you describe a work as poetic? For me, poetry is the great compressor, right? It's a possibility of with very uh, economic means, in other words, with very reduced number of words, for example, you can actually say a lot, a lot more than if you wrote an essay. Poetry allows us through ambiguity and through uh, double sense and uh, all these things, it allows us to create a mental universe, you know, which is very different when I read it than when you read it. So a poetic work is one which doesn't have a teleology. It's a work that doesn't have already an objective, but rather it develops in the actual reading and, and the reading is a part of the artwork itself. How has your work changed in the last two years? We've gone through such change. I got pretty bad COVID infection in March of 2020. So I was uh, for five weeks touch and go. So that was humbling, <laughs> the fragility of, of life. Montaigne said that to philosophize is to learn how to die. And I think that that's similar to what art making is, right? So much of our art and mine and, you know, and other people that I like are always thinking about the end of life. They're thinking about mourning. They're thinking about continuity. They're thinking about all of these, these things. And so I'm trying to, to react and to think carefully about how, how to make art about our time and that cannot be divorced from, from, on the one hand, the desire to control people, which is exactly what is happening. So algorithmically, my concern is the same as everybody else. You know, people are being manipulated in many different ways. So in that world, how do we make a contribution? You know, I don't have the answers, but I'm saying each one of the artworks is trying to articulate a certain degree of urgency on this kind of problems that we have. Both Barbara and uh, Raphael might like to answer this because I think it's, uh, it's about curatorship. I'm excited to learn about the intention of museums to conserve the aesthetic of the media project to allow new iterations rather than wanting to preserve it as a static object. However, I wonder if incorporating new technological equipment would present a problem in terms of conservation. Once you have identified a work, you have to have the artists, hopefully they're alive, you have to have them come in and you have to get down what are the aesthetics and you have to get if all of the ins and outs about it. I forget if it was you, Raphael, when we acquired your work, I worked with our media conservator and we had questions for you that nobody had ever asked. So the question was this, Barbara acquired a work called 33 questions per minute, which runs on liquid crystal displays. This is a piece of software that was written in Delphi, which is a programming language that very few people speak now on top of Pascal for Windows 95. And the question is, should we as a museum stockpile, you know, 40 years worth of Windows 95 computers to run this project? And the answer is no, because we're going to give you, and we did, all of the source code of the project for you to be able to make a version of the project for a different platform. And they did that. And so by doing that, it, the work liberated the need to have a stockpile of Windows 95 machines. And if you see side by side, a copy of the work running in Linux and a copy of the work running in Windows 95, they were identical. So the answer to this question, for me, the artist and the curator of the institution need to specify very clearly what elements are replaceable and what elements are not. So for example, there's works of mine where I say this, it, this depends on this incandescent light bulb. When you can no longer find incandescent light bulbs, this piece should die an honorable death. And then the museum or the collector agrees that that is a fundamental part of the artwork that cannot be changed. 
On the other hand, the computer that runs this thing, I don't care what it is because it's it's somewhere else. So I say to a very young artist, I taught for quite a while up at Yale and I would always first thing tell the students, you are the conservator of your life. If you don't take care of that work, if you don't understand what it's about, then you better leave. <laughs> so 